another way of saying amen and amen. So let it be, Lord, let it be. Today our message is coming from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11, verse 9 and 10. You can find in the Pew Bible on page 844 this particular passage of Scripture. And so I would encourage you to open the Bible to that place, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But I'd just like to begin by saying that there is a chance that today's message may seem a bit disconnected. I, up front, I, I just want to share that it might appear as if we're jumping around from passage to passage. It might seem as if we're reading God's word here, we're hearing God's word. And, and you might even find yourself thinking, yeah, preacher, is there a main point to this that you're preaching on today? Well, I pray that it will be so. But can we just wait and see what God might be saying this morning? And so the passage is from Luke chapter 11, verse 9 and 10. The title is, Are You Listening? And as we're going through experiencing God, we're, we're learning the different realities of what it means to come and to know God. And the reality over the next two weeks that we're going to be dealing with is that God speaks. And so the, the message entitled, Are You Listening? Are We Listening? fits right in, I, I pray. The reality is this, God speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, through prayer, through circumstances, through the church, to reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways. And so God is wanting to speak to individuals and to a congregation, but in order for that to happen, we've learned that we must draw close to him and have an intimate love relationship with him, begins with Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, but then develops and grows stronger as we spend time in the word, spend time in prayer, and we are aware of what's going on around us and as we meet together as the church. And so are we listening? Are you listening. You know, last year was our 150th anniversary. Our susquicentennial. Were you, were, you, were you ever able to get that to roll off your tongue? Susquicentennial. Let's just try it. One, two, three. Susquicentennial. Yeah, that was good. That was really good. Our 150th anniversary. Our congregation began on Christmas Day in 1869. What a great day to start a church, isn't it? And so we celebrated last year. We took the time and we had a time of celebration, opportunities to celebrate. We also took opportunities to renovate as we renovated our worship center here as well. Well, this year and for the foreseeable future, we are asking God to help us to innovate. Well, what on earth does that mean? What do we mean? Well, what we're meaning is that we're asking the Lord to bring about church revitalization. God did cause us to be a church that is vital for this community. This community doesn't exist for us. We're here for this community and beyond. Now we're a country church with a global mission to influence the world for Christ beginning right next door. And so we're asking God to cause us to be vital. Lord, revitalize us. Give us a fresh encounter with you, a closer walk with thee. Help us, Father God, to be the people of God you want us to be. Several weeks ago, Diane and I made a commitment, and that is that we were going to set the alarm on our uh, cell phones to go off at 11.09 every day. And that was to be a reminder for us to pray for the body of Christ, known as Grandview Baptist Church, to pray for church revitalization, to pray for you, and to pray for us. And we've continued with that commitment all the way through this day. And folk have said, well, why? Why 1109? Well, it comes from the verses of Scripture we're looking at this morning. This is kind of a springboard into the message, these verses today. Jesus in chapter 11 of Luke has been teaching his disciples how to pray. They said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And so he gave them what we know as the Lord's Prayer. But down in verse 9, he's continuing with this attitude of prayer. How do we pray? Look, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks the door will be opened. 
And so we are asking the question as we ask, seek, and knock, are we, are you listening? Years ago, Diane and I found ourselves in the city of Budapest, Hungary. Now Budapest is a beautiful city. Um, the Danube River flows through the center of that particular town. We happened to be there at winter time. It was cold and it was snowy. And uh, what's interesting about the city of Budapest is that it used to be two principalities. There was Buda, the city of Buda, over on the west bank of the Danube, and Pest was on the eastern bank. And about 160, 170 years ago, they formed into one community, one principality, and it's, it's known as Budapest today. Well, most of the shopping and most of the things that we were involved in ministry-wise and such were on the Buddha side, but the guest house that the IMB, International Mission Board, had for us to stay in was on the Pest side. And so we would have to ride a tram to get from one side to the other and go across the bridge that you just saw. We were on a tram and we had gone way over into the town where we needed to be. We were involved with what we were doing and it was a cold, snowy night. And we started working our way back now to the guest house. We got on a tram and we rode across the bridge and we figured everything was okay and didn't realize that the tram took a wrong turn or a turn different than what we were used to. We were just enjoying looking out the windows at the scenery and we'd hear at every stop Hungarian. And of course, we don't understand Hungarian. It was going right over our heads. And so, you know, it, we, it, it would stop and Hungarian would tell, I guess, the, the stop that we were at and people would get off and we'd go a little farther down to the next stop, Hungarian, and people would get off. And we just kept going stop after stop after stop till finally there wasn't anybody else left on the tram but us. And we're like, wow, well, that's really something. But, you know, we were enjoying the evening and finally it came to a stop and it didn't move. Hungarian... Oh, we were, again, looking, oh, look how beautiful it is. I was like, Hungarian. <laughs> oh, wasn't it a great day? We sure enjoyed today. It was a lot of good things happened. Hungarian. <laughs> we said, oh, aren't you glad we're sitting on this nice, warm tram here on this cold, snowy night? And then, in English, <laughs> the tram driver, the conductor finally said, hello, hello. <laughs> this is the last stop. Please get off of the tram. <laughs> We hadn't been listening. Well, we were, but we weren't paying any attention because it was something we couldn't understand. But finally, cut through the, the, the miscommunication, said, hey, this is the last stop. Get off. And so we did. And that tram then took off toward the barn, and there we were, and we did not recognize where we were. We had no clue. We were like, uh-oh, we were on the wrong tram. We were on the wrong tram. Are you listening? God speaks to us and speaks to his people and he wants us to hear his voice. He speaks to you and he speaks to me, but he doesn't speak in a language we don't understand. The problem is that we're not tuned in to want to listen to hear what he has to say. And I pray this morning we tune in and that we do listen. Are you aware that the phrase, he who has ears, let him hear, it appears 14 times in the New Testament. It was just unique this, this day, this last week. I was putting it in and doing a search, and I just had it 14 times. And the seven of them speak to a time where Jesus is speaking about a parable. Seven of them, half of them, speak about a parable that Jesus is t telling. And so he is the one who speaks all 14 times about let him who have he has ears, let him hear. And the other seven center around a message that Jesus has for each of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. And so as I was thinking about listening, he who has ears, let him hear. Those of us as we're asking, seeking, knocking for the Lord to reveal to us his plan, his way for us as a congregation, this began to formulate this last week. And so, when we think about are you listening, let's begin with this general message. He who has ears, let him hear. Do you know the parable that this centers around? It's really interesting. It's a parable that shows up in all the Gospels. Seven different times Jesus says it. Well, we're in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11. Just, just turn back to, to chapter 8. We're in the same, same book. Luke, chapter 8. 
And what we find out beginning in verse 5, that it is the parable of the soils. Jesus used that phrase, let him who has ears, let him hear seven different times as he was referring to the parable of the soils. Now I have heard this particular parable described as the parable of the sower. But it's actually the parable of the soils. You see, there is a sower, there is a farmer involved, but it's the farmer's responsibility to just cast the seed, to sow the seed. It's the soil's responsibility to receive it and then interact with it however the soil is ready to interact. And so let's take a look at that. Are we listening? Verse 5 following, A farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and it was trampled on, and the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on rock where it came up, the plants with, well, withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil and it came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. Now at first you think, well a farmer ought to know better than where to put his seed. I mean, some of you have been growing gardens this last week. You didn't plant your garden out in the parking lot, did you? You planted it on the soil that you knew would produce the best. You, farmers go out and prepare the place where they're going to put the grain, the seed, so it'll go in the soil. They prepare it, they plant it, they cultivate it, do all that's necessary to see a harvest come forth. But in this particular parable that Jesus is saying, he just says a farmer went out to sow his seed. He was just, and in those days, you know, they, would, they were casting the seed, a bag of seed on, or, and a bag over their hip, and they would cast the seed as they would go. And some would fall in places where it maybe not produce much. Well, the disciples were saying, well, Lord, I understand. Well, what's this parable really mean? And down in verse 11, Jesus says, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. The gospel message. Jesus saves. Verse 12, those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rock are the ones who received the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in time of testing they fall away. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering produce a crop. My interpretation of, of Scripture here is that there is only one of the four sets of soils that do not receive the seed, do not receive the good news. There's only one set of soil that is not saved. And that is on the path where it is so hard and, and the soil can't receive it. And in fact, it just says, verse 12, those along the path are the ones who hear and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. There are those, I pray not here in this hearing today, but those who their heart is so hard that the seed of the gospel of Jesus, of the love of God through Christ does not penetrate, but yet the gospel has been shared. And the gospel is shared throughout our community, and, and but yet there are those who still have not received it, and, and they have not been saved. But the others are those who are saved, but they struggle in some ways. Verse 13, those on the rock are the ones who receive the word with joy. They've received it. They rejoice when they hear it, but they don't have a root. And they believe for a while, but in the same time of testing, they fall away. They, they have not matured in their faith. They, they receive Christ, and they're babes in Christ. And they begin with the milk of the, of the good news of God, you know but they're not able to move forward. A baby who only has um, formula cannot continue to grow and be strong and, and to gain all that the baby should gain. They move on to another kind of food, to a softer food, and they move on to, to, um, to regular food. And as believers in Jesus, we're to do the same. That when we receive the word of God, we are to then read it and contemplate it and allow ourselves to grow in what God would be teaching us. 
are there some here and within the hearing today? You've received Christ, but you still would be considered a babe in Christ, a, a, a young child of God, no matter what age you might be, but you haven't grown in God. Verse 14 says that there was seed that also fell among thorns, standing for those who hear. I mean, they've, they've received it, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they don't mature. Now, all of us, there's been times where we've had worries deflect us from really following God, trusting Him. In other cases, we're lured by riches and pleasures, and, and so we have not matured to the level that God would want us to mature. Paul said to the church in Corinth that, you know, you're still babes. I can only write to you these simple things. By now you should be eating meat, meaning that you should be grasping the, the deep things of God, but they still hadn't yet. Are there those of us this morning who we know Christ, He is our Lord and Savior, but, but we don't feast on the deep things of God. We're, we're still caught by that which glitters and we turn our head easily to some of the things of the world instead of following and trusting the Lord. And in verse 15, but the seed on good soils stands for those noble of good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering produce a crop. Are there those of us who are, are good soil and we're trying to produce what God would want to do through us? So we talk about, are you listening? It's, it, it's this, Father God, speak to me at the level where I am so that I hear your voice calling me from the stage, the level of my faith, and to call me to a deeper walk with you, Lord. Call me, please, and by faith I will follow. And so there was this general message. It's a message of evangelism. It's a message of sowing the gospel seed. Could it be that God in a year ahead is calling us to, to really learn how to share Jesus with other people? Now the term, I guess, officially would be evangelism training, but that scares us sometimes. But it's the idea of knowing, Lord, Father God, how can I sit down with a neighbor, a friend, a loved one, and just bring up in, gospel, in conversation the good news of Jesus and let them know God loves them, loves them in Christ. Could it be God is wanting us to recognize? Are you listening? Let's do evangelism. Let's get involved in sharing the gospel seed. So that was a general message. But now there is also a specific message. And in this case, it's not just who, he who has ears, let him hear. In the book of Revelation, there are seven churches that Jesus gives a message specifically to each one of these churches. And he says this to all seven of those churches. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to those churches. What's being said is that there is a clear and specific message that's given by Christ to every church. Also, I think, to every Christian. And so let's turn to the book of Revelation. Let's just take a look at those. Very last book of the Bible. Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. There is this clear and specific message that the Lord speaks to every one of these churches. Where is the body of Christ known as Granby Baptist Church in this passage? Where are you in this series of scriptures? Where do you fall in? Let's just take a look. First is that there is the busy church in Ephesus. The busy church. In verse, chapter 2, verse 1, it says, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. That's, of course, Jesus saying, I'm the one. I'm the one that walks among the churches. Now he says to this church, this busy church, he says, I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men and that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not. You have found them false. And so you have persevered and have endured hardship for my name. You have not grown weary yet. Verse 4. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. This is a message to a busy church. Jesus says, I see what you're doing. I see all your hard labor, your activity, all the things that are going on there. He even said, seems to say it's a blessing. 
you are really mindful of what it is to have a theological foundation. You're active in sharing and persevering, working hard, all of your deeds. But then he does say this, you have forsaken your first love. And it's the idea that they've gotten so busy in doing that they have left being. Now, isn't it interesting that God created us in our English language anyway? We're, we're human beings, not human doings. <laughs> and we are to be who God wants us to be in him. And sometimes we can fall into the trap of just being active, being busy, but it keeps us from being still. Doesn't God's word say, be still and know that I am the Lord? And so when we are seeking the Father, we can't be busy all the time and our minds on other things and we miss out on the chance to really hear what God might be saying. This can be in the life of a church, can be in the life of a Christian. And so there is this busy church at Ephesus. Then we have the suffering church in Smyrna. Verse 8, it says, These are the words of him who is the first and the last who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say that you are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. Now, I don't really know of a congregation in America that's undergoing persecution like this church seems to be undergoing. And I know there have been some churches that have been uh, told they can't meet or they have a, a reduced number. And, and I just praise the Lord for some of those congregations that have just said, hey, we're going to just we're going to meet. We're just going to get together. We're gonna, you, you do what you got to do, government, but we're going to be who we are. We're, we're the family of God. But there's no churches really that I know of in the states that are suffering like other churches and congregations around the globe where it is the threat of serious persecution. That when they gather for worship, they don't know. There could be a bomb go off. There could be an attack on that particular place. And there are people who gather in homes in, 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 in secret and they worship the Lord, not loudly, but quietly. And they praise God because they don't know if their neighbor is going to be causing them some problems. It happens and it is happening. And so there is a suffering church. It could be, even here in our number this morning, there is an individual or two. You're suffering for your faith. You can't be vocal in your family or at your place of work. And I mean, really, there is that threat that something could happen or you would lose your job because of all of that. Our prayers are with you. To the busy church at Ephesus, the Lord had a message. To the suffering church at Smyrna, he said, hang in there. I'll give you the crown of life. But then we move to this church that finds itself in a difficult place. It says in verse 12, These are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has made his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. See it? We're talking persecution. But then, listen, he goes on to this church. This church finds themselves in a difficult place. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols, by committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. He says, repent, therefore... Otherwise, I will soon come to you and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. This church seems to be standing for the Lord, but they're in a difficult place. They recognize what's going on in their culture around them, and they're sort of kind of dabbling in some of the cultural stuff. They seem to be allowing into who they are as a body of Christ, and they're making exceptions with some things that... Exceptions are not in Scripture to be made. There seems to be this. You, you, you have people there who hold to these teachings, and, and these teachings were leading to sin, and, and they were not of God. 
And sometimes in our own personal life, we can find ourselves in a difficult place to where we know what it is to stand for the Lord. We know what his word teaches us, but we, we can sort of begin to dabble in some of the things of the world. We move on to the compromising church. What we're noticing here is kind of a, a slippery slope. When you start off in a difficult place, you stand for the word, but then you start kind of looking at some things and dabbling in some areas, playing the fringe on some things. You find yourself soon compromising your positions. Verse 18, these are the words of the Son of God whose eyes are like a blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and your faith, your service and perseverance, and that you now are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches the hearts and the minds, and I will repay each according to your deeds. It seems as if this church has become so compromising that they now are accepting of the, the, the progressive things of culture. Okay, well, this is the thing that's going on today. This must be where we need to then progress ourselves to be more open, more accepting. And Okay, all right. And to the point to where even the leadership of the congregation, they're promoting this. There are churches across our nation today that are openly accepting of what is popular in culture. But God's word is very sure, very clear on who we are to be. We cannot, we should not, not by our decision, it's the word of God. And we trust it and we follow it and we don't compromise. Oh, but Christian, if we find ourselves in a difficult place and we start playing the fringe and you know we can begin compromising ourselves. And if we find ourselves compromising with some of the things of the world, we can find ourselves in deep trouble because then we get close to the next church, the dead church in Sardis. It says in chapter 3, verse 1, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive. What does the word say next? But you are dead. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up! Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. The church might think it's alive. An individual Christian might think they're alive. But in fact, the Lord Jesus says, but you're dead. There's nothing that shows life in you that is uh, reflective of the life that I give through the Holy Spirit in your life. Do you see the progression? To each and every one of these churches, you'll notice toward the end of each of those passages, it says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. But praise God, it doesn't end there. Look, there's the church that's on mission. The church in Philadelphia. In verse 7 of chapter 3, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. This is God who's doing that work. I know your deeds. See, I've placed before you an open door that no one can shut. Now I know that you have little strength. Praise the Lord. Any church that tries to do any ministry, any Christian that tries to do any act in their own strength, it's not going, to, not going to follow through. It is the strength of the Lord. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word, have not denied my name. And I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews that are not, but they are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. <laughs> 
He says in verse 10, Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. That's speaking about the great tribulation. That those who are a church or an individual on mission with God in the power of the Holy Spirit, when the rapture comes, when the second coming of Christ takes place, you will not go through the tribulation. God's promise. You will not go through the hour of trial. Oh, praise the Lord for that. But God is asking, looking for, seeking those congregations that would be a church on mission. Who would say, Lord, we're the clay, you're the potter. You form us into what you wish us to be and then work through us that we might be your people on mission with you. You, your strength, your power working through us. And then there's a promise that we find really that's made for all church. Well, there's one more, excuse me. There is the satisfied with itself church in Laodicea. Verse 14. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. The, the literal term is vomit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I acquired wealth. I don't need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Satisfied with itself, church. There are churches like that in America today. Who are satisfied with where they are. Satisfied with what they're doing. Satisfied with, and so they're relying on themselves. There are Christians who are satisfied with themselves. They're satisfied with the level of commitment and devotion they have to God. Satisfied with their level of relationship with God. Oh, but the Lord has a message to each of us. Look what it says. Verse 19 and following. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone, what's it say? Anyone hears my voice? Are you listening? Are we listening? If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Now here's that wrap up of all the seven churches. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, as we wrap up our message, let's Consider four truths this morning. Are you listening? First is that God speaks when he's about to accomplish his purposes. God does let his people know, whether an individual or a congregation, he will speak so that in that process, he lets us know what he's about ready to want to accomplish in his purposes. It is a God-sized task. And, but sometimes we will think, oh, a God-sized task, that means it must be big. It very well could be. But sometimes it's small. But it is a task that God calls an individual or a church to, but it is following and trusting the Lord to do that task. And so God speaks when he's about to accomplish his purposes. God initiates what God initiates, he completes. What God initiates, he completes. A couple of verses in the scriptures, it says in the book of Isaiah 46, 11, what I have said, that I will bring about. What I have planned, that will I do. When God is sharing what he's about to do to accomplish his purposes, he then will bring it about. What he initiates, what he begins, he will complete. Another passage in the book of Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, it says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. There's a gospel of Mark. There's a story of where Jesus and some of the disciples get in a boat and they're on one side of the shore of the Sea of Galilee and they're going to the other side. And as they're going through the Sea of Galilee in the boat, a storm comes up, a great, great storm. And the water's coming over the side of the boat and the disciples are doing everything they know how to do. They're setting the sail just right. They're bailing, they're rowing. What? And finally they go back to the Lord and he's where? <laughs> he's asleep in the back of the boat heads on a pillow, and they wake him up and they say, Lord, 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 don't you care? We're about to die. We're about to drown. And the Lord said what? Oh, ye of little faith. Do you know why he said that? He said a sentence to them as they were getting into the boat. He said, let's go over to the other side. 
That's what the Lord said. Let's go over to the other side. He was saying, here's the plan. We're going over to the other side. Are there going to be storms? Perhaps. Are there going to be times where we think, oh man, what are we getting into? But the Lord said, let's go over to the other side. He says, why is your faith so small? Because he... What I have said, that will I bring about. What I have planned, that will I do. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. We can trust the Lord. Amen? Amen. Are you listening? Where God guides, he provides. That's a cute saying, but it's true. If God is guiding us, he'll provide. The resources are in the harvest. They taught us that overseas. I hadn't even heard that before until we were living overseas. And we're out, just the two of us, looking to start home Bible groups. And we might find one person that would be willing to have us come into their home. And we'd start having Bible studies. And we'd invite their neighbors. They'd invite their family members. And we'd just begin seeing those who we could share the good news, the love of the Lord with. And there, from that group, there would be those who, who became part of the Christian family, who joined, who were, were born again by the good news of Jesus Christ. And so it was from that harvest, from that, from that uh, group, the resources were in that harvest that, that helped them form a Bible group, a home Bible study in that place. And then over here in that place, the resources are in the harvest. I mean, this last week, Fred, you've been cutting beans and you went out at the early part of the season and you planted all the seed that you needed to plant, but, but, but you, you knew the resources that were going to carry you through to, to next year to take care of the bills this year and to move forward into next year, it was going to have to come from the harvest. There's no other place for it to come from. And so the resources that God desires for us to have to move forward, whatever that is, but it can be more than likely in the harvest. Well, let's draw this to a close. There we were, standing at that tram stop and it was cold and those tracks just went on and on and on and we watched that tram as it went on to the barn and it finally disappeared around a corner and we were like what do we do now I mean what should we do should we wait and hope that another tram comes by and will pick us up from the other direction I mean it's the end of the season at the end of the night they're, they're going to the barn should we take off walking, following the tracks, and hope that we wouldn't get caught in between stops? Because if you take off from the stop you're at and you're going, to, okay, let's try to get to the next stop. Um, but yet if a tram comes while you're stuck in between, it won't stop for you. You have to be at the stop. Or should we cut across the tracks and, and go try to find a place that we maybe recognize and we can find ourselves back home? What do we do? What should we do? Well, what should we do as a congregation? <laughs> What did it say back there in the Gospel of Luke? So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks the door will be opened. So what should we do? Should we see if we can figure out a direction that makes sense and go that way? Should we look at our budget and our weekly giving and, and let that govern what we should or shouldn't do? What if we just jump in and get involved in something, anything, so that we at least are doing something? What if we do what Diane and I did at that tram stop in Budapest? You know what we did? We waited. We actually were praying, Lord, what do we do? <laughs> And we just waited. We waited and we waited. It took a while, but the wait was worth it. <laughs> because another tram did come. And it was the right tram that we needed and it took us toward the direction we wanted to go. So, like I said at the beginning, we might be asking ourselves, what's the main point of all this today? May I just present this as we ask, as we seek, as we knock. What if we wait? What if we wait on the Lord and just say, God, here we are, your people. 
We want to be a revitalized congregation. We want to be people on mission with you. But Lord, we want you to direct our steps. So what if we wait and pray and seek and ask and knock until we've heard from the Lord? What say you? Thank you for hearing the message of God today. If you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, you can be. The Lord has a plan for each of our lives. If you've been a follower and you find yourself distant from the Lord, you can draw once again close to Him. The Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means all of us. But it goes on to say that the wages of sin is death. It's cut off forever from God. But the free gift of God is eternal life. The gift is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. What a wonderful gift. The Bible lets us know that if we will repent, if we will turn away from sin, turn only to God, it says all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. No matter where we are. You know, in the book of 1 John, chapter 1, verse 9, it says, If we confess our sin, we find ourselves, as even as a Christian, separated or, or distant from God. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we can start again, fresh and new, that moment on. And so this morning, we're going to have a hymn. We're going to sing an invitation. And as we sing two verses of this invitation, it's a chance for us to draw close to the Lord. The hymn is, The Savior is Waiting. And is He waiting for you? Waiting for you to say, I need Jesus. Or I want to confess and get right with Jesus. Whatever it would be. So let's stand together, dear friends. Let's stand and sing. Two verses from hymn 412. The Savior is waiting. <laughs> 